Here's what you're missing over at patreon.com slash addressing Gettysburg. From the Gettysburg Museum of History Studios, you're listening to Addressing Gettysburg. Hello, everybody, and welcome to this episode of Addressing Gettysburg. I don't know why my microphone is up so high. There we go. Let's turn it down a bit. Uh, Welcome to this episode of Addressing Gettysburg. And uh, today, we are talking about a book. And this book has been out. It was written originally in 1987. It was revised in 1984. And recently, back in April, republished by Savas Beatty. It is called Bullets Flew Like Hail. Cutler's Brigade at Gettysburg from McPherson's Ridge to Culp's Hill. You know, I notice that about books nowadays. The the titles are like a paragraph long, you know? <laughs> it's like you're getting it all out there. But um, uh, James uh, McLean Jr. is our guest today. He's the author of the book as well. Welcome to the show, James. Thank you. Now, you see, you were all worried. I messed up right in the beginning there. I had my microphone too loud. So Well, know. there you go. And I'm leaving it in. I'm not and, cutting and it And the out. original title was just Cutler's Brigade at Gettysburg. Sa- yeah. Savas liked the idea of adding yeah. everything he could to the title. <laughs> that seems to be the new way of doing things. You know, you add. I think it's a marketing thing. I agree. And I, I, I think it's because Cutler's Brigade at Gettysburg Maybe, you know, to the casual observer, that wouldn't really catch their eye because who's Cutler, right? Right. It's not the Iron Brigade. Right. Exactly. But the bullets flew like hail. That's interesting. And then, you know, from McPherson's Ridge to Culp's Hill, we've heard of those. So that uh, that I think it is a little better to do it that way. Uh, All right. So let's talk a little bit about Cutler's Brigade. First, we're going to what we're going to focus on today, ladies and gentlemen, is Chapter Seven. Of course, you know we want you to uh, go and get the book and learn the rest for yourself because we can't possibly cover it all in one interview here. Uh, so that's why we're focusing on Chapter Seven, which is called Fowler's Demi Brigade and the Fight at the Middle Railroad Cut. But before we get to that, we want to give a little background uh, into the brigade as a whole. Can we do that? Sure. All right. So Cutler's Brigade, go ahead. Well, it was a brigade that was pieced together throughout 1862 and 1863. Uh, Doubleday, Abner Doubleday, commanded three of the regiments early in 62. Okay. And then eventually two other regiments were added to it, the 147th New York and the 7th Indiana. Okay. So there was a Western element to the, to the brigade, and Cutler himself had originally been colonel of the 6th Wisconsin. Uh, oh, interesting. And then some thought that after his wound at uh, the Battle of Brawner Farm, he may become the brigadier general of the Iron Brigade, but that didn't come to fruition. So he took over the brigade in the spring of 63. Who was the commander prior to Cutler? Uh, who? Uh, Gibbons, John Gibbons. John Gibbons, con- that's right. Controlled the, the Iron Brigade, commanded the Iron Brigade. <clears throat> no, I'm sorry, uh, of Cutler's brigade, who was the commander? It, it did not have a commander per se. Because it was because put it, together it, it by was, two. It, well, Doubleday commanded the brigade for a while, and then he moved up to uh, division. a division command. And then Cutler took over the three regiments, and then the two extra. Ones. Got it. Okay, so the the two were extra, or the two extra ones were added after Cutler took over the original three. Right, and Got then okay. and then there was an a, a sixth regiment, the Fourteenth Brooklyn or Fourteenth New York State Militia, or Eighty Fourth New York. They they went by all of those yeah. names. Yeah, uh, they belong to, believe it or not, another Iron Brigade called the Eastern Iron Brigade, which was made up of two year New York regiments and themselves they were a three-year regiment okay so uh in may of 63 the two-year regiments started mustering out of the army of the potomac and when they were all gone it was just cutler's brigade or or, uh, the 14th brooklyn left from the eastern iron brigade so they had to be placed somewhere and they ended up being placed with the um with Cutler and and his men, so he essentially they became the most veteran regiment in his brigade. Gotcha. Uh, and so let's fast forward now to Gettysburg uh, on the the campaign. Uh, they're obviously part of the first corps. Uh, 
Correct. Um, and so the morning of July 1st. Um, well, first of all, I guess let's go back to June 30th. Where are they on June 30th? June 30th, they, Cutler's Brigade is south of Marsh Creek near Reynolds headquarters at the Moritz Tavern. Mm-hmm. Uh, the, the Western Iron Brigade is just a bit north of Marsh Creek. Okay. And the other divisions are strung out towards Emmitsburg, the other two divisions in the 1st Corps. So, all right. Okay. So they're the lead division. They're right. in the lead division, I should say. Yes. Okay. That's, and that's Wadsworth's division. Right. So, uh, so the, the first comes, uh, everybody's all excited. There's something brewing at Gettysburg. And the left wing is going to move towards there with the first corps in the lead. Um, Reynolds, again, is a left wing commander, so he's not in command of his normal first corps. Uh, Doubleday has moved up to that position. And, uh, and so when I, I believe I read a story somewhere that when uh, Reynolds gets on the road to go up and talk to Buford, he, uh, you know, he's already given Doubleday the order to get the Corps moving and everything, and he sees Wadsworth, Wadsworth's division still essentially in camp, and he says, what the hell's this? And Wadsworth's like, well, we're last in line today, and he goes, you know, none of that stuff, let's go, like, get up there, right? And then they, they get up on their feet and get stuff together and start moving up. Right. The, right. the first division on the 30th had moved first, so the typical... Uh, marching pattern would have placed another division in the lead of the march but since they were closest to Gettysburg Reynolds wanted them moving quickly no time for right and the normal procedure be- because the second division which or the second brigade Cutler's brigade was closest to Reynolds they got the orders first so they crossed Marsh Marsh Creek and they headed for Gettysburg and the the um the iron brigade was was Behind them, behind them, yeah. um, and so they get up to Gettysburg uh, and get on the field. Is Buford's division still fighting at that point, or have they retired? They're they're waiting they, for the infantry to come up, right? They're still they're still making up their presence known. Basically, there are three ridges there on the first day's fight. There is the Seminary Ridge, which mm-hmm. obviously has the Seminary. There's what I call the Middle Ridge, which is where Reynolds Avenue goes today, goes today, which is would be on the east side of the Herbst Woods, and it's also the road that crosses over the railroad cut by mm-hmm. the bridge. And then there's a, a, a westernmost ridge, which is where the McPherson Farm had been, and the McPherson Barn still stands today. Mm-hmm. So uh, Cutler, being that he's first in line, they're going to get there first, and they're going to move uh, north of the uh, the Chambersburg Pike and the railroad cut. But they're going to leave. That's only three of the regiments. Two of them are going to be left where? Well, two of them are going to be left near the McPherson uh, barn and farm. Uh, Reynolds decides he needs a presence on the battery that he places on that western ridge, Hall's second main battery. So he wants a presence on both sides of Hall's battery as support. So two of the regiments, the 56 Pennsylvania and 76 New York, cross the road between the the middle and seminary ridge and, and keep going north before they start to their left or to their west. And the the regiment in the middle which is the 147th New York doesn't get any orders and he sees they see people going in two different directions so they figure they'll just move move over to the McPherson barn and wait for orders which they eventually get so they end up being on the west ridge the 56 Pennsylvania and the 76 New York are on the middle ridge when they start taking fire. And then the 14th Brooklyn and the 95th New York are between McPherson Farm Buildings and Herbst Woods. And uh, Hall's Battery is right where the Buford statue is today. Correct. Correct. Uh, Okay. And so now uh, those two regiments, though, uh, that we're talking about today, the 14th Brooklyn and the 95th New York, they're... They're cut off from the main body of the brigade, basically. 
So they're put under the command of a colonel, Colonel Fowler. Correct. And so we have a demi brigade. That right. right. The first time I saw that word, I think was reading uh, Tucker's High Tide at Gettysburg. <laughs> okay. And and but yes, that they Colonel Fowler has been placed in, in command of them. He he took over the 14th Brooklyn right after First Bull Run when their colonel was, was uh, seriously wounded in action. And then he led the brigade for quite some time until August 29th, 1862, when he was wounded at Groveton, which was part of the second Manassas campaign. Right. And then he comes back in January of 63, and he's again in command of the brigade. And uh, or the regiment, rather. Right, right. So the uh, what? Are, what are Fowler's orders? Just to go there and support the battery, or because Archer's brigade is still coming up, right? Or is coming up? Yeah, Archer's brigade has their skirmishers in advance, moving down the east slope of a hair ridge, and they're crossing over Willoughby Run, and they're moving mostly into the Herbst Woods. Uh, Fowler, with his two regiments, ends up receiving fire from those skirmishers from the woods. So they end up firing back, and and they keep keep the Confederate skirmishers at bay for for some time. So that eventually the Western Iron Brigade comes into the woods and hits those regiments of Archer's Brigade in flank and drives them away. Um, and uh, so, because all of Archer's brigade isn't coming up all together, am I correct in that? Like they're kind of, or they're not because there's the uh, the quarry gets in the way. Yeah, right. So they, they, they're not. I, if they're you look of, at the battlefield, yeah. if you and I was out there this morning, if you look straight across from where the 14th Brooklyn would have been, it's it's not flat, but there's a relatively long distance between their line straight west to where Willoughby Run would be, where it's open terrain, they would have a good field of fire for anybody advancing across there. In addition, Hall's battery would have been on the road, and they could have enfiladed any Confederate troops coming across Mm. to attack them. So Archer's men tended to shift to, let's see, their right, which would have been south, to take cover in the woods, Mm. and from there they could, I guess, hopefully swing around and outflank the 14th Brooklyn and the 95th New York. So who who is it in Archer's brigade that that, uh, Fowler's Demi Brigade is facing? Is it just the 7th Tennessee, or is it the 7th and the 14th? I would, it's hard to say. Certainly there are skirmishers and soldiers from the 7th Tennessee, but there's also the 5th Alabama Battalion and a, right. couple, a couple of companies, I want to say f- from one of the other regiments that I'm not sure. 13th which, Alabama? Maybe, maybe the 13th. They're serv- they have served as skirmishers from the very beginning of the morning. Yeah, I think it's the 5th the way, and the 13th. All the way through. So they would be in advance as well. Okay. So uh, and but but so is it just the skirmishers they're dealing with before the Iron Brigade gets there, or do they actually deal with the main line of one of the regiments? I, I think they're b- basically dealing just with the skirmishers because I don't think the Seventh Tennessee is going to come out into that open ground. Mm. And if you look, if you visit the battlefield and look at the terrain on the north edge of McPherson's Woods, sort of where the Seventh Wisconsin Monument is today. You, Got it. When you when you go when you look down towards the west, the ground drops precipitously yeah. there. Yeah. So there's no way that a Confederate unit is going to climb up that distance and and make an attack uh, at that point. Which is one of the things that's always surprised me is. Who were the Confederates that fired at the Second Wisconsin when they entered the Herbst Woods? Mm-hmm. And it doesn't seem to me that it could have been the Seventh Tennessee because they would have had to have come up that large distance. Uh, oh, yeah. And, and then, <laughs> that's, sorry, no, that's all right. I got a. <laughs> what song I, is that? It, it's, 
I have a Scottish heritage, and that's it's just a Scottish ditty of some sort. Listen to the rest of this interview and dozens like it. Support the show and get early access to special episodes, early and discounted ticket sales, and more. The second lieutenant level and above gets access to all monthly Patreon episodes. So please go to patreon.com slash addressing Gettysburg, choose a tier, and join. And I thank you in advance.